Shalom Nechem, Erev Tov. Tonight's year was dedicated by my parents, Elu Nishmat, my grandmother, Safta Chana Biton. Aishat Chayim Nimtza. V'rachok m'nivim m'chayim, v'rachem m'kol b'lita v'yichus, v'yichmod v'chem, anevesh, v'rach m'chama, shal hanifteret b'shem tov min ha'olam, Chana Bat Zohara, Ruach Chadonai Tenechena Bagan Eden. Hiv v'chod b'not Yisrael Shachvot, ima b'chlan ha'chami v'sidichot v'chani ha'zom, v'nomar amen. It's ten years since her passing, her neshama shal hav anyan gan eden. B'zad Hashem Nibar. We're on page 403 in file number two. So not file number three, file number two. Maran writes, Hamashkim kodem or hayom. Somebody who wakes up before sunrise. Mivarech kol sedar haberachot. He recites all of the berachot in order. Meaning, all the morning berachot. Chutz mi birkat hanoten ha Except for the blessing of hanoten ha-sechvivina. Hanoten, he who gives... What's a sechvi? The rooster. Yeah. Bina. Understanding. To know the difference between day and night. Ufarashat tamid. And also, parashat tamid. Yamtin melomra. We should wait to say it. Ad shi or hayom. Until sun rise. Why? Why should a person wait? Right, because nothing happened yet at midnight that the rooster is going to make his sound. And therefore, one should wait until daytime. Says the Ramav al Khatkhilan, ideally, you told Yadav Kodam Shivarech Limod. A person should wash their hands before they recite a blessing to learn. Okay, we're gonna Rama will leave for something else. Let's talk about what people do. It's quite clear that the Acharonim don't accept the ruling of Maran. And that many people, many people seem to follow that practice. Let's read in page 403 under the two lines. This is file number two, so not file number three. Is that I airdropped the file for you for later, not for right now. Was that air? Hakam mimitato, somebody who wakes up in the morning be'odai in a while, it's still dark. Uverech berkot ha-Torah, they recite the blessing on the Torah. Ve'asak ba-Torah, they involve themselves in the Torah. Ve'chazar lishon be'odai la-shenatkev ba'al-mitato, and they go back to sleep at night, for the whole night. Tzarich lachzor uverech berkot ha-Torah b'shem malchut k'shiakum mishnato b'boker. When you wake up in the morning, you have to say the brachot again of the Torah. But if you wake up in the morning, you don't have to say the Torah again. Okay, this seems to be in disagreement with Maran, but he says that if you wake up in the daytime, you don't have to say the blessings again. Nonetheless. Okay, okay. Okay, we're going to stop here. Okay, we're going to stop here. Okay, we're going to stop here. Page 404, the top of the page, Halakha Yudalit in chapter 47. Nashim, woman, Mevarcho to recite the blessing of Birkat Torah. Boy. A woman obligated to learn Torah? The first halakha in the Rambam's laws of Talmud Torah. If you open up Mishneh Torah, the laws of Torah study, chapter 1, the first sentence, Rambam writes, Nashim, woman, pturim Talmud Torah, are exempt from the study of Torah.
אין לי מה זה, אנשים ועבדים וקטנים פטורים בתלמוד תורה. Women and slaves and minor children are exempt from the study of Torah. אבל קטן, אביו חייב ללמדו תורה. But a young child, his father has to teach him Torah. שלמר לקצז, ולימדתם אותם את בניכם לדבר בם. You must teach your sons the Torah. ואין האישה חייבת ללמד את בנה. And a woman does not have to teach her son Torah. She has no obligation. שכל החייב ללמוד, חייב ללמד. Because only one who is obligated to learn is obligated to teach. But she is not obligated to study Torah, and therefore, she does not have to teach her son's Torah. And just like a person has an obligation to teach their son, so my father had an obligation to teach me, he has an obligation to teach my son. Because it says in the Torah, You must tell these rules to your children, to your sons, and to the sons of your sons. ולא בנו ובן בנו בלבד, if you want to read along with me, you can look up רמב״ם, משנה תורה, in Safaria, look הלכה, click משנה תורה, click laws of Torah, study chapter 1. Not just your own child, your grandchild you have to teach, אלא מצווה על כל חכם וחכם מישראל ללמד את כל התלמידים אף על פי שאינן בנם. Every חכם has an obligation to teach all of the students, even if they are not his children. Why? Shneemar, it says in the Torah, Veshinantam levanecha. You should review these with your sons. Mipia shemua lamdu. We learn from the shemua, meaning our chachamim tell us. What does that mean? Elu banecha, elu talmidecha. Your sons are your students. Shat talmidim kiruim banim. That one's students are called their children. So then why a special obligation to teach your children first? אם כן, למה נצטווה על בנו ועל בן בנו? להקדים בנו לבין בנו ובין בנו לבין חברו. To tell you that your children, there's a hierarchy, yes? You teach your son before you teach your grandson, and you teach your friend, your son, or your grandson before you teach your friend's son. Yes, so far. Yeah. We learned that mothers teach their children at the young age, but up to six. So how is this not uh, an obligation for them? The Shema, the whole thing, the mother is doing it. Because she wants to, not because she has to. The obligation falls on the husband. Scroll down, Halakha 13. If I'm making you upset, it's okay. That's the point, right? That's the point. Sefaria, Halakha, Mishneh Torah, The Laws of Torah Study, Chapter 1. It's not opening. Are you connected to the Wi-Fi? Oh, yes, it must be. Okay, let me read you a halakha in the Rambam. I'll read it to you once, and then I will read it to you properly. You understand? First, I'm going to read it once, and then I will read it properly. Mishneh Torah, Hilchot Talmud Torah, Torah study, chapter 1. And now we're in Halakha 13. Isha Shalamda Torah, if a woman studies Torah, Yesh la Sachar, she receives a reward for studying Torah. Aval eno kishar ha'ish. But it's not the same reward as the reward of a man. Why? Because she was not obligated to learn Torah. And anyone who does something which they're not obligated to do 
אין שכרו כשכר המצווה שעשה, אלא פחות ממנו. One who is obligated to do a mitzvah receives a greater reward than one who opts to, they, they choose to opt into doing a mitzvah. Yes? If I tell my son, clean your room, and he cleans his room, he's better than the child who went to clean his room without me telling him. Why? How? Chachamim debate this matter. One listened to me, one did something on his own. It's harder. The kid who's in the middle of cleaning his room, uh, optionally, and he goes, hey, you have to finish cleaning your room. Hey, excuse me. I was doing this out of my own free will. Now you're making me do it? I don't want to do it anymore. There's something. That's perhaps one understanding. Another understanding is literally one is fulfilling the, the will of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, And one is fulfilling, sure, a mitzvah, but it's not what a Kadosh Baruch Hu commanded them to do. I'll leave this note on the side for a moment. This is a different conversation. And even though a woman has received reward for learning Torah, our rabbis instructed that a man should not teach his daughter Torah. The reason, if you hang up on me in the middle of this Rambam, you're going to be very angry at me. So wait until the end, let me explain it to you, and then you still could be angry at me if you want, but I'm, then give me a chance. Why? Because the majority of women their mind is not concentrating the majority of women their mind is not trained or not able to properly focus on their studies. Ela, rather, hen motziot divrei Torah li divrei Havai. They take the words of the Torah and they take them to be, they interpret them in nonsensical ways. They bring them to nonsensical conclusions. Because their intelligence is lacking. Our rabbis told us, Anyone who teaches their daughter Torah, as if he taught her Tiflut. Now, the Tiflut, in this context, can mean something else, but if you want, Tiflut literally means something uh, immodest, uh, inappropriate, profane. This is the oral law. But the Torah that's written, ideally he shouldn't teach her. And if he taught her, it's not like somebody who taught his daughter Tiflut. So this is particularly as it relates to the oral law as opposed to the written law. A man should not teach his daughter Torah. Correct? And the reason is because her intelligence, her intelligence is lacking and therefore she interprets the Torah in a nonsensical way. Havai, she takes the sacred Torah and brings it to be Havai, which is just nonsensical Torah. And because of that, he shouldn't teach her Torah. All right, now you really read this Rambam and tell me what the average Jew, the modern American Jew, what do they do with this Rambam? Discriminate. Yeah, the Rambam, it's not a law. This is just a, his times was that way. The Rambam was a chauvinist. Oh, whatever you want to say, yeah. No, what, what would a person do with this Rambam? <laughs> he gives uh, more support to the, the feminists who say that there's no place for women wow. in Orthodox Judaism and they have to make up their own rules because they want to empower women. Right. Now, this Rambam, I want to read it to you. The way that a dear friend of mine, Chacham Eib Faur, the son of Rabbi Faur, how he read this Rambam to his students, and I had the zikhut to listen to him read it in a video, he made a video about it. Let me now read to you this Rambam, the way that a Sephardi Chacham would read the Rambam, okay? So don't, don't be just a person who reads the Rambam. Listen carefully. Isha Shalamda Torah. 
A woman who studies Torah, yesh la sachar, she receives a reward. Let me pause for a moment. I have a shiur online that every human being must listen to. I'm sorry if I sound uh, full of myself, but not because of me, but because of who I'm talking about in the shiur. There's a lady. Her name was Rabbanit Farcha Sassoon. She was one of the preeminent Torah scholars of the Sephardic world. And when she lived across the aisle, Sephardim and Ashkenazim, they treated her with reverence and respect. It helped that she was also the wealthiest Jewish lady around. But she corresponded with the Benish Chai. She corresponded with Rabbi Tzach Nisim. She corresponded with Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler. She called all the Chachamim you can imagine of that generation. They had Torah conversations with her. And in there, I discuss my truest, deepest opinions about Torah study for women and what women are capable of bringing to the Bede Midrash. If you want to understand my heart, go to that shiur. But there I mentioned the Teshuvah. Abitrak Nisim, the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, told Rabbanit Sassoon that he really wishes to sit down and write a Teshuvah, a proper Teshuvah, whether, when we see a man who's a Tamich Chacham, we recite a special blessing over him. Yes? Now, when we see a woman who's a Tamidah Chachamah, do we recite or Tamidat Chachamim? By the way, is it a Tamidah Chachamah or a Tamidat Chachamim? How do you say a female Torah scholar? Okay, Chachamah would be the Chacham? Uh, Chachamah, okay. So, let me ask you this. What's the plural, the male plural of Tamid Chacham? We usually say Talmidei Chachamim. Harav Peret also says Talmidei Chachamim. Harav Kapach and those who are in the camp of the Rambam would argue that the plural is Talmid Chachamim. Right? Or Talmidei Chachamim. Why Talmidei Chachamim? Because it's not a matter of he's a Talmid Chacham. He's a Talmid Chachamim. He's a student of the Chachamim. Talmid Chacham means a wise student. But no, they're Chachamim and they're students of the Chachamim. Talmidei Chachamim. And therefore, by a woman it would be a Talmidat Chachamim. Not a Talmida Chachama. Though in modern Hebrew likely they would say Talmida Chachama. But really, if we're trying to say that she's a student of the Chachamim, we would call her a Talmidat Chachamim, not a Talmida Chachama. So he said, I wish that I would have time to ask this question. If I would see a woman who is a Torah scholar, do we recite this blessing over her as well? Now there was a posek who did write a teshuvah, but this, I don't want to mention his name. He says that if you see a woman who's a talmidah chachama, not only can you not recite a blessing about her, he says, no way in the world, he says you can't even respect her. Because she violated the words of chachamim, that woman don't study Torah. Who does she think she is going to study Torah? It's an avera that she did. How do you make a blessing over an avera? He is the only one who answered the question. But how, how could he say that? That women and children and men, everyone That's was right. present at Mansane when we, uh, when we received the Torah. So how could he say that? There's a lot of rereadings of that text uh, in Orthodox literature. And I may don't suggest you read it, but likely you'll come across it if you Google this question. Let me... Let me read to you the Rambam like I wanted to read to you. Isha, a woman, Shalamda Torah, who studied Torah, Yesh la Sachar, she has a reward. Aval Enoch is Chacha Ish, she does not receive the reward like a man. Why? Mipnei Shalom Nitzavet, because she was not obligated. Vechol Haosei Davar, Shalom Metzuvei Anav, Lasoto, En Sacharo Kishar Metzuvei, Shasa, Ela Pachot Mimenu. So the Rambam is saying the reason why a woman receives less reward is only because of how this, this reward, the mechanism of reward operates. For whatever reason, HaKadosh Baruch rewards those who are obligated in something more than he rewards someone who is not obligated in something. But does that take away from the first statement that a woman who studies Torah receives Zachar for studying Torah? If this was an Avera, would she receive reward for an Avera? No. So then what's the first thing you learn from the Rambam? Though women are exempt from learning Torah, if they study Torah, They receive reward, which tells you that the study of Torah for women is a mitzvah. Definitely not an avera. It's a mitzvah. Or else, why would you get a reward for it? Yes? So this is statement number one. How do you then reconcile the Rambam's second statement 
that one shouldn't teach his daughter Torah with a first statement. That's the problem everybody has. So now let me read to you this Rambam, the way a Sephardic Tami Chacham would read it. Let's read. And I'm attributing this reading to Chacham Faur, the son. Should live in Biwa. And even though she has a reward, our Chachamim instructed. What does it mean, Tzivu Chachamim? That phrase, Tzivu Chachamim. Is this, a, is this a rabbinic law? Yeah, who are Chachamim? Is it a law? That's my question to you. When the Rambam used the word Tzivu, First thing you should read. <laughs> Rabbi Eib Faur said that his father told him, every time you see Chachamim say, Tzivu Chachamim, it's a personal instruction. This is not a national legislation. This is personal instruction that Chachamim gave to their students. So understand first and foremost that the easiest way to say it is not a contradiction. One is a law. A woman is per- exempt, but if she studies Torah, it's a reward. The second here, but that being said, Chachamim gave personal instruction not to teach Torah to one's daughter. Let's read. Shiloyilamed Adam et Bito Torah. Does it say that a man should not teach a woman Torah? Does it say that? What does it say? A father should not teach his daughter Torah. Remember that teaching. If the Rambam was telling you that Chachamim said you should not teach women Torah, what would it say? Chachamim, tzivu Chachamim, that a man should not teach a woman Torah. Right? But it doesn't say that. It also doesn't say, tzivu Chachamim, that a woman shouldn't learn Torah. It doesn't say that, right? So it's saying something very, very specific. Let's read a little bit more before we get that specific. Because the majority of women, their minds were not trained to learn properly. Explain to me that sentence. And yes, use the Rambam's world when you're saying this, or the Chachamim's world, who wrote this. There was a world where women didn't study. Women's study was not a thing. Women didn't go to school at all. It's not that they went to elementary school, they didn't go to yeshiva, they didn't study at all. Women were illiterate. Is that the reality? Of course. That was a reality, for th- a painful reality, for thousands of years. By the way, almost till 100 years ago. I have an article I wrote by my other grandmother, my father's mother, who taught herself to read Hebrew. Yeah. There's still Jewish communities that are absolutely adamant. Yeah, but why do you have to go so far? Do any of the Jewish day schools here in San Diego teach girls Talmud? No, none of them. None of them. None of them. Because they still, Orthodox Jewry, still reads this the way an Orthodox Jew would read this paragraph. Let me read to you it. I'm going to read it to you properly now. What's the danger of a woman whose mind has not been trained to study properly? What's the danger? Who cares? So what if she learns? So what does she? What does she end up doing? What does the Rambam say? She yeah. She's gonna misunderstand it and then teach it to others the wrong way, and, a whole, and then the next generation of people who don't know how the real way. Okay, so it doesn't say anything about the next generation. What does it say she's going to do? Okay. She's going to take divrei Torah. What is Torah? It's our whole life. Our whole world is the Torah. She's going to take the Torah and she will turn it into Divrei Havai. What is Divrei Havai? Nonsense. What is nonsense? Translate for me nonsense. Not something that's useful. Like for one day. One day. Can you tell me one thing that Jewish people do today that it does not come from the Torah that lacks any type of meaning. It's Havai. Okay, let's say it's a good example. You think that in order to get a good Parnassah, and forgive me for all the people I'm offending right now, you should be offended. 
you also be embarrassed, but be offended. You think that getting a parnasa is not going to work. That doesn't give you a parnasa. Not going to study. That doesn't give you a parnasa. What's going to give you a parnasa? You're going to bake bread and stick keys inside of them. And Nakadosh Baruch Hu magically is going to see the bread that you created. Ah, this person needs a parnasa. That's the definition of divrei Torah and divrei Havai. You have a mezuzah on your door. You have a mezuzah on your door. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, why do you put the mezuzah on your door? It, does, it doesn't say. Because I told you so. Because I told you so. The Rambam, the Rambam writes, right, I, I, you know, I'm using, um, I'm used to my Rambam in a book. Give me one second. I want to read to a Rambam. Uh, if I can find it in my Think of in the right place. Says the Rambam. Minhag Pashut, there's a simple custom. Shekodvim al hamizuzah mi bachutz that they write on the outside of the mizuzah. Keneged harevach shaben parasha le parasha between where there's space. Shadai. They write the name Shaddai. What is Shaddai? Shaddai is Hashem's name. Hashem's name. Shaddai. That's what it is. And it doesn't invalidate the mezuzah because it's on the outside of the mezuzah. But those who write inside of the mezuzah, Shemot HaMalachim, the names of all kinds of angels, or Shemot Kedoshim, or the names of holy people, or all kinds of other names of Hashem, holy names, or Pasuk, or Chotamot, all kinds of other biblical psukim or other stamps, whatever he's referring to. They fall into the category of those people who have no portion in the world to come. Why? What do they think the mezuzah does? They think the mezuzah protects them. Because they think the mezuzah protects them, the Rambam is not writing this in Moen Avuchim here. The Rambam is writing this in his book of Halachot, in the laws of Mezuzah, in chapter 5. This is a Halacha, the Rambam is telling you. She'elu hatipshim, that these stupid people, lo dai lahem, it's not bad enough for them, she'bitlu ha-mitzvah. It's not bad enough that they're not fulfilling the mitzvah of Mezuzah. Ela she'asu mitzvah gedola, she'hi yichud Hashem shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They took a mitzvah, the greatest mitzvah, which is the unification of Hashem's name, ve'avato on the love of Hashem, ve'avodato on the service of Hashem, and they turned it into some type of amulet, a good luck charm. That is there to serve themselves. So the mezuzah went from being something that we put on our door, we proclaim to the world, we believe in one God. This is our God. What did they turn the mezuzah into? A protection amulet for themselves. Kemo she'ala alibam hasachal and that's what entered their stupid heart. Because they think that the mezuzah is something that is going to protect them or help them somehow in this world. Heard what the Rambam said? The Rambam gave you a definition of how you turn Torah into Havai. You take a mitzvah that the Kadosh Baruch Hu commanded you. That's supposed to be about the belief in the Kadosh Baruch Hu, about the love of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, but the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you turn it into a good luck charm. And then what happens? Says the Rambam, not only do you not get a mitzvah anymore, but you also show the stupidity of your heart and your mind. You took a mitzvah that is so precious, and you turned it into some kamea. Now you might think that this is not something that happens anymore. I don't think that any one of you have in your house a mezuzah that doesn't have magical names of Hashem inside of it. Now it's, but then underneath it, it has more names. Yeah. You better believe it. Go home and unroll your mezuzah. Now already the Chachamim Lindu Zachut, Rabbi has already um, justified this practice. Okay, I'm not getting involved right now. 
But at least the belief, forget the names of the angels, the belief. Don't people have this belief the mezuzah protects them? Yeah. Isn't what they tell you at school? Yeah. Isn't that what every rabbi, when they put them, oh, the mezuzah is going to protect the house. By the way, Maran, Maran is bothered here. Maran, the case of Mishneh, he has a point, he says, I don't understand. The Rambam is saying this, it's very sharp. But isn't there a famous story about Unkulus? Uh-huh. Remember that story? Yachan, tell me the story. Actually, he just learned it today. Oh, okay. Take that out of your mouth and put it in your plate for a second and tell me the story of Unkulus. Okay. Is it a swallow or is it a chew? Swallow. swallow. Okay, come here. Tell me the story of Unculus. So Titus, the evil emperor, had a nephew. His name was? Unculus. Okay, what happened? And he used to send him to travel to places around the world. Then You're telling everybody, did you? one time he went to the... He was passing through his life and he heard... Some, and then he would sat down... Um, and he heard, and then he heard some Torah, and then he stayed there. After a few years, he converted to Judaism. He converted to Judaism. And then his uncle wasn't very happy about this. Yeah. So what did he do? No, his uncle sent search parties after him. Then one of the generals found him. He sent the general there with the army. They go, they go, they tra- 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 take him. And he kisses the mezuzah, and they were like, hey, what did you just do? And he was like, and he said, oh, what what happened? When, when my uncle sends you to war. When my uncle sends you to war, you stand in front, and he's in the back protecting him. Yes. Yeah. In, but with our God, instead of us protecting him, he protects us. How? With this mezuzah. With the mezuzah. We go to sleep inside and he stays outside watching and protecting us. Yes? And then they sit down, they learn up. And they all converted to Judaism. Too. Then another group comes. But that was, that was the story. Yeah, good. that's the story that I wanted. Yeah, thank you. So now, Maran says, didn't you just hear, didn't Uncle Luz just teach us that a Kadosh Bachu stands outside of the door protecting us? Is that what the Gemara just said? Yes. So Maran answers... Why would you learn anything from something that Unculus is telling Roman generals to save his life? He's trying to make a point here. There's not a teaching of his. Unculus doesn't teach us that the uh, He's trying to give them a reason that they can understand that will make them leave him alone. That's not the truth. But rather, says Maran, you can believe in general that when you perform his vote and you fulfill a Kadosh Bahu's will, that he will take care of you. You can believe that. But it can't turn a specific mitzvah into some type of magical uh, thing that will protect you and preserve you, that's already a mistake. Yes, yeah, so Maran is clarifying this. But here, back to our Rambam, right? Back to our Rambam, in the laws of Talmud Torah, the Rambam is telling us that the danger of a person learning Torah, the greatest source of knowledge in the world, is that they're going to misinterpret these teachings and turn them into keys inside of Chalot or red strings around their wrists, or what else? Lead pouring, pouring, thank you, Al-Khanan. For Ayn Hara. He's been around for a while. Khanan's a member of the Bermuda. Very good. Making blessings into all kinds of other amulets. Go on, the Judaism is not full. The Judaism is not full of all kinds of things that people do, magical things they do. It's magical thinking. Yeah. So all of these things is the day. So by the way, the Rambam would tell you today. The Rambam would tell you today that you probably shouldn't teach Torah to to ignorant men either. But the Rambam does rule that. The Rambam does write that later. That a man who's not cut out for learning Torah, you shouldn't be teaching him Torah. I mean, this is a problem all across the board. <clears throat> but a Chachamim's generation was especially a problem with women. Doesn't the Mishnah Perkei would say? You increase your property, you also increase your worries. The more you own, the more things you worry about. You don't own anything, you got nothing to worry about. Increase women. You increase the sorcery that's there. There was a time in the world where women, for whatever reason, and it could very well be connected to the lack of education, involved themselves in all kinds of superstitious things. Says the Rambam, the greatest tragedy would be to teach your daughter Torah and to see her take the Torah and turn it into some kind of magical thing. 
Now, I'm a thousand percent convinced the Ramban would say this about a man also. It's not exclusively to women. But Chachamim, Tzivu Chachamim, why? Sherov Nashim, the majority of women. Does it say all women? No. Do we have examples of women in our tradition that have studied Torah successfully? Yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. So then what's the problem here? The problem is, listen carefully, that a man should not teach his daughter Torah. Remember I told you that's the big difference? A father teaching his daughter who's not educated. She doesn't have an edu formal education. Maybe he's not a good enough Torah teacher. And him teaching his daughter Torah, not so great, not with not the type of rigor that is necessary, will allow her Torah teaching to turn into some type of superstition. So if a woman wants to learn Torah, where should she go learn Torah? By the Chachamim. Chachamim were not telling men not to teach women Torah. To the contrary. They were telling men that if women wish to study Torah, it should be done in a formal setting of a yeshiva. Not in an informal setting of a house. It should be done under the supervision, under the care of people who will make sure that the right women are coming to study Torah. That the right teachers are teaching them Torah. That the things that are being taught are done properly, the way the Chachamim would want us to understand these things, just like they would do for men in a yeshiva. That's how Bet Yaakov started. And I don't talk about Bet Yaakov. There is no such Bet Yaakov that's today is a fabrication. It's a fantasy that was created in someone's mind. This Limut Torah is done under the supervision of Chachamim. Chachamim are supervising what's happening. And if a Chacham teaches a woman Torah, then, then he's responsible for that learning, and just like he's responsible for all his other students, he will make sure that his students come out correct. And then is the Rambam talking about that person? No. And the reason why Chachamim didn't legislate this matter, and rather it's a personal tzivu Chachamim, our rabbis, they instructed their students. Why? Because this is the type of thing that's eternal? No, this type of thing can change. This can change. And I would tell you today that I include, you want to hear it out there? The vast majority of Orthodox Jews study Torah like this. Divrei Torah became Divrei Havai. They don't learn Torah. They think they learn Torah. But they don't learn Torah. They learn Torah and believe in all kinds of magical things. You cannot learn our Torah, the same Torah that Chachamim taught us, and also believe in, in Harry Potter Judaism. Harry Potter is fine. You want to read Harry Potter? Great. But the people who read Harry Potter, they know that it's fake. Yeah? The people who read Harry Potter Judaism, they think it's real. That's the danger. They think the things they're learning are actually real. And that's the most terrifying thing ever. This whole... Don't women learn by men all the time? I don't think I'm the one suggesting. Everyone, all the women... They do, but they don't go to yeshiva to learn. They go to some facility that's designated for women. Okay, let's say yeshiva for girls. Fine. By the way, I'm all for women teaching women Torah. Assuming that women already became Chachamim. We have a generations of women Chachamim. But don't, don't, tell me, don't tell me that you've never been in your life to a Rosh Chodesh party. Don't tell me you ever went to your life where women's Torah education consists of making menorahs and dreidels and stained glass windows and mir miraculous pancakes and all kinds of, uh, all kinds of nonsensical things. Because the Jewish community, at least the one that I'm familiar with, treats women like their study of Torah is it's a Rosh Chodesh parties. That's exactly who I'm talking about. But that's a mitzvah. Rosh Chodesh party is a mitzvah. A woman should celebrate Rosh Chodesh. So one day I'm going to write a book on having parents inside of your community. <laughs> because you have to wear two hats. You're also the rabbi, you're also the son. And so as a rabbi, you should say all kinds of things, but as a son, you can't. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to uh, just say like this. <clears throat> celebrating Rosh Chodesh is a mitzvah. Our Chachamim have a way with celebrating Rosh Chodesh. We say halal, we eat food, we wear nice clothing, we don't, we don't talk about the bodily fluid of the month, and we don't talk about the color of the month, <laughs> and we don't dance kumbayahu under the moon. And we don't, all those things already are, are, I don't know where they come. But why am I telling you this? Because all of you know women who are not in Kolel right now. All of you, I'm not talking to you. Nobody, anybody here is listening to this who's a woman. Has no, you, it's already been obvious to you an hour ago that I'm not talking about you. Correct? Yeah. We're talking about all the other women. That all their, and it could be that it's not their fault. 
It could be that that's the way the Jewish community educated them, molded them to be like, I'm not blaming, I'm not putting a blame on anybody. <clears throat> but in which, if you would go to a community, and you would say, okay, here's what's happening, the schedule of the week today, we have dafyomi for men every single day, we have halakha class twice a week for men, we have parasha class for men, and then we have stories of the Baal Shem Tov for women. Why? Why can't they do, you don't want daf yomi? Fine. I don't think anybody should daf yomi. Halakha? Halakha? Why not parashat ha-shavua? Meaning, I, why is it that women are offered the worst of the Jewish educations? And then what happens, those women go to seminary, and they become the rebbitsons of the seminary. You should hear the things these people say when nobody's watching them. Because in the community, at least there's somebody watching them. But over there in Yerushalayim, in the seminaries, you know the kind of things they say? Who's check? Which yeshiva did they go to? Which chacham did they learn from? Or chachama already, Baruch Hashem. Which chachama did they learn from? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. And that's the whole purpose of everything we do here. When we have a bed of midrash that is co-ed, it's intentional. It's intentional to create a generation of women who are chachamim, chachamot. And we don't have to worry anymore that if we don't do a menorah martini event or a sushi what rhymes with sushi? Uh, I don't know. Whatever. A sushi and and, uh, and and beer and Torah event. We don't have to do that. Look at Baruch Hashem. We have people learning Torah. So everybody who's here is changing the tide. I'm not talking about you. But what's happening out there, the Rambam's words are still relevant. See, but today I'd include so many men. Even if there's rabbis I would put in this category. You can't teach them Torah. Because they take the words of the Torah. What did the Rambam say in the introduction to Agadot? Or the Rabbin Abraham and which one? It says those rabbis that teach the Agadah literally, and they're the majority, and most of them do that in their darashot. When they teach the public, there are all kinds of fantastical midrashim they teach them. It says the Rambam, this is the majority of the rabbis we're talking about. It's the largest group. So who's left? The Rambam says there, there's a third group. People who understand Agadah properly, say, but there's so few of them that it wouldn't be fair to call them a group. There's not enough to be in a group. It's like it would be calling the moon and the sun a group. It's not a group, it's just, they're individuals. And that's the generation we live in. So as much as we like to pretend. I get these Jewish catalogs all the time with the new books that are coming out. I haven't been inclined to purchase a Jewish book that's been printed in the last 50 years. Forever. I, almost nothing. A big time I mean, yes. But the regular books the Jewish people are buying, they're spending all their money on, it's unbelievable people read. And it, the worst, they read it. You know, I read all kinds of things. To believe it? And you read articles. So it was April Fool's this week. You read it, you know it's a joke. But you read these books, you think it's an April Fool's joke, but it's not. It's not, it's real. Look, I'm going to read to you right now. <clears throat> this week I got in my inbox two halachot I didn't know about this till this year. I didn't know them because the Kadosh Buhu didn't hear about them either. The first one, the first one is the halachot of kashering your braces for Pesach. And if, if, you, if you think I'm making it up, I'll send you the article. How to kasher your braces. The second one, and this is my favorite, this one. This one is special. I'm going to show it to you so you don't you'll believe me. Not to eat hot foods on Pesach. Some have the custom not to eat hot foods of 110 degrees or more on Pesach, being that their teeth cannot be properly kashered. Oh, my. You, you need to understand something. Blow torch. Blow your teeth, yeah. And the other article about the braces talk about people drinking scalding hot liquids so that their teeth are um, kashered by them. But here's what you have to understand. What you have here, Moshe Rabbeinu also had teeth? Yeah. yeah? But he never told anybody about the halachot of kashering. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he had teeth? Yeah. So he never told anybody about the laws of kashering. Rambam and Maran had teeth? Hopefully. Yeah. They didn't tell anybody the halachot of kashering. So all of a sudden, come and wow, we're the first Jewish generation who realize there's a big problem on Pesach. We don't know how to cash our teeth. <laughs> and these people think that they're chasidim, they're tzadikim, they're what, what are you? You're an am ha'aret. If, if there's, there's a reason why for 2,000 years nobody even said the words kashering teeth because they would be laughed out of the Ben-Midrash. Yet today they write articles, they put their names on it, they're so proud of it. It's something amazing. Here, kashering braces. What is the proper method to clean and kasher my mouth for Pesach? This is an article written by a rabbi in Petach Tikva. 
a Ooh. rabbi. Meaning, he's not a, he's clear that Tamich Chacham, he has some sources here. And he goes through a whole, the whole conversation. Here, I'll read you the last paragraph. In practice, fillings or braces needn't be kasher. Though one must stop eating hot chametz 24 hours before the time for finishing to eat chametz, so that any taste in the teeth or the braces or the fillings should be pagum. Some have a hidur, it's a stringency, for Pesach, to kasher them somewhat, by drinking a hot drink above 113 degrees Fahrenheit, or at least slightly hotter than one usually drinks, before the Zman. Dentures should be kashered by pouring from a klirishon. But if they might get damaged, they should be placed in a klishani. So when I said this to somebody, they told me they had a very expensive... Very expensive. Something made in Italy, some custom mouthpiece, something like that. The rabbi told them that to pour it in a pot of boiling hot water, and it got mangled out of shape. Thousands really? of dollars of damage. For what? You think Chamin didn't think about not being able to cash your teeth? So you're laughing. It sounds funny, but there are people that go home and they they believe in this. This is how they celebrate Pesach. What's the source of this one? No one celebrates um, um, Pesach. A mental health disorder. <laughs> no, there's all kinds of sor- sources, Liminahim, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he writes here in the notes, by the way, that the Chabad Rebbe's were very particular not to have dentures. What? Because they were afraid of the ka- kashrut. But let me ask you. I, I, there are people who have all kinds of teeth issues, teeth fall out, teeth break, all kinds of things happen to teeth. People need things in their mouth all the time. It's not, a, it's not an unusual thing. So what do you do? You just lose all your teeth? Now more than that, more than that, let me ask you a question. Between meat and milk, do you cash your teeth? No. So what happened all of a sudden now? Why Pesach? Because Pesach is worse. Eating meat and milk together. What about on Yom Kippur? I don't mean you're getting a beliot. I don't know what... what it's an unusual thing. We live in an unusual world. And so that's what the Rambam is worried about. He says women sh- are, are, a man should not teach his daughter Torah. Meaning, if you want to teach Torah to your daughter, allow her to study in a proper system that will educate her in a way in which to think. And like I tell you, I would love to believe that our schools do that job, but I'm convinced it's not the case also for men. And Uh, and, just, and you see those distortions. That's right. And that's that's something, you know, I see it now. I want to tell you something. This is not a politically incorrect statement. I'm going to tell you now. Yeah, all of you know how we practiced the kila the last two years, so don't suspect me of anything. I remember the middle of the height of, of the COVID pandemic. I would see people alone in their car. Alone, alone. So they're not Uber drivers driving somewhere. They're not, yeah, just, with double masks and a face visor mm-hmm. in their car alone with the window or shut. with the window shut or the guy on his bicycle i saw a guy he couldn't have been younger than 70 years old riding a bike up my hill my hill is hard enough to walk let alone ride a bike with two masks on and it was alone he was alone it was the middle of the day everybody's at work it was hot outside mm-hmm. you, saw, I say, you saw the same guy and listen of all the things what can you say about such a person you can say that they don't know what to be afraid of. Correct? I mean, if they were in a group of people, fine. If they were indoors with people, fine. If they, whatever it would be. I'm not talking now about the whether masks work or don't work. I'm not, that's not my point now. But you see a person who doesn't know what to be afraid of. So what are they doing? They're reacting in all kinds of crazy ways. They're doing things that are not normal because, because they, don't know what, they don't know what should be normal. And likely, by the way, the same guy who was wearing a mask on his motorcycle, but not a helmet, yes, tells you that he has no idea anything about safety because he's telling you that he's worried about this, but he's not worried about this. 
So you're doing 65 miles an hour without a helmet, but you're wearing a mask. So are you smart or are you stupid? You, you go, by the way, to any modern medical system. I recently had to visit someone in the emergency room. Have you ever seen the food they serve people in the emergency room? In the hospital. That food is intended to send people right back to the hospital. I'm going to tell you the truth. Especially in California. I don't know other places where they live. But in California, where people, many more people are health conscious than maybe other places. A person eats a regular diet of healthy food. And they go to the hospital and they're serving them things that are high in fat, high in cholesterol, high in, in, in but things that you would, in salt, in sugar. And by the best part, I went to visit one somebody who was diabetic. So they don't let them have sugar. What are they doing? The, everything they eat has aspartame in it. Everything. And there, there are, you know, when you put a lollipop with aspartame on the ground, the ants don't eat it. But even the ants, even the ants know that that's dangerous for them. Yeah, what, but so in, in someone's house, you see them drinking that, fine. But at a hospital, somebody tells you there's a disconnect in the way that people are understanding things. And therefore, it, their actions are distorted. So you hear about Pesach, and you hear that people are doing things like kashering their knobs on the faucet. Why are they doing that? Why? Because they don't know what chametz is. They don't know what to look for. They're covering their countertops and their cabinets with aluminum foil. They're lining their refrigerators with paper, contact paper. These people are not, they're not bad people. They don't understand the definition of chametz. They also don't understand how chametz transfers from one thing to another. And because of that, their behavior comes off as neurotic. And it's not their fault, but they are products of a system that hasn't educated. They've told them, be careful of chametz, ha, but you don't know what chametz is, it could be everywhere. It's hiding. It comes with the air conditioning vents of your car. It happens even when there's no chametz around. So that kind of person, you, what do you expect? Their halakha, is go, their halakha is going to come out crazy. And when that goes on for one generation or two generations or three generations or five generations, when rabbis start teaching these things, then that's a very scary world. And so let me bring you back to the Shulchan Aruch on page 404. The Rambam rules, Chaval, my mother doesn't hear this. The Rambam rules, Nashim mevarchot birkat Torah. Women recite the blessings over the Torah. What are the blessings over the Torah? We said it? Yeah. How could a woman recite a blessing over something that she doesn't have to learn? Where? Is it like the morning blessings where we say it and we, we're of the opinion that we're saying it because it's something that everybody does, those morning blessings. So maybe it's the same thing. We're all listening to the Torah. So you can, you can try to say that, but then there's all kinds of other blessings women should then say in the same vein, right? Here, what's unusual, it's not, if, see, if the Ramah would say this, then we'd say, okay, he's consistent. The Ashkenazim, they recite all kinds of blessings that they're not obligated in. Like on the sukkah, on the lulav, on all kinds of things. But here, this is Maran. Maran who says that women don't recite blessings over things they're not obligated in. Maran is clearly telling you that women are obligated in limu Torah. It may not be the same obligation as a man. Yes? Mm -hmm. Does a woman have an obligation to keep kasher? Yes. So she has to learn Torah. Does a woman have an obligation to keep Shabbat? She has to learn Torah. Yeah. Women have an obligation to say brachot over food. She has to learn Torah. Well, you ask what a woman has an obligation to keep Pesach, Purim, Chanukah, Shavuot. All. So yes, so she has to learn halachot. She has to learn Torah. So perhaps all that we're talking about is some type of theoretical Torah that people, men are obligated to study everything. The women are obligated to study at the very least the things they need to know. Yes, you want, you want to say that? Fine. At the end of the day, Maran says, for that reason, women say Birkota Torah. And therefore, women have to study Torah. They shouldn't, I don't see a contradiction here. But very simply, I will say, that this understanding that a woman says Birkota Torah tells you exactly what Maran feels about Torah study for women. The women are obligated. And that theoretical Torah, I, just like I told you about I, Daf Yomi, I'm of the opinion that nobody should be studying theoretical Torah. How, how much time do you have in your life to study Torah? And now you're studying theoretical Torah. 
I have a question now, though. Yes, Brenda. It's about this. Um, so you were saying that, you know, we, we women should keep, uh, like, Shabbat and all this stuff. And and I was, somebody told me, I mean, because I'm converting stuff. So I was speaking to somebody who's Israeli, you know, but like you said, they're not always the best Jewish people, I guess. And they were telling me, um, oh, when are you going to be done converting? And I was like, what? What do you mean? They're like, oh, well, you know, because some people learn in schools and some people do this and, and I told him oh well, I'm doing it I said the proper way I guess but I, I you know and he's like oh you're doing orthodox you're going full in and I'm like what do you mean I'm going full in I'm like there's halfway conversion and halfway to he goes well a woman should just keep kosher and shabbat that's really the main thing for a woman mm-hmm. and that's how I was like the, it's reminding me of the people you're talking about that are creating their own systems I guess for what women should be and not so I just have a question like that's obviously not the right answer. So, right. Well, what I mean, do you I mean, say to somebody like that? Nothing. Don't be rude no, you people. just don't. You don't. You don't talk to people like that. Uh, that's my best advice. Uh, but I'll tell you, like the first off, first off, one thing. Whenever someone goes through a conversion process in Judaism, they're always the recipients of the most ridiculous, unsolicited advice in the whole world. And I see from the way some people are nodding their heads that it doesn't end after the conversion stops either. It's their whole life. It's un- unsolicited and. If it was good advice and it's unsolicited, that's one thing. But if it's bad advice, why, why are you even bothering sharing this with me? It's like, you know, they have these things where before people get married, they all be given advice on marriage. And those people have the worst advice for marriage. It's almost amazing how those people are still married based on the advice they're giving people. A miracle from HaKadosh Baruch they're still married. Yeah? But here you have a very interesting thing. I once, I once uh, had a roommate who told me that he will never date a woman who went to university. You have to understand, this is a guy who's Yanni studying to become a rabbi. And let's be honest, rabbis don't make a lot of money. And at the very least, you wanted to have a little bit of food in your house, you want your wife to have a good job. And he's saying he doesn't want a wife who went to university. And I look at him and I say, why? He said, I will never be able to live with a woman who is smarter than me. And at that moment, I felt the guy was miserable. But I also felt, wow, he's very self-aware. He knows she's an idiot. And he realizes he marries someone with some kind of education. She's going to make him feel like an idiot for the rest of his life. And that, that is something we find in Judaism also. Uh, Jews who are afraid of educated women, of a halachically observant women, of women who are scholars of Torah, are just people who are very um, um, insecure about their own study of Torah. I dream for the world that I can walk into whole rooms, batei midrash of women, that you can bring up halachot and gemarot and mishnayot and, and, and have conversations with that, on, on the same level of study. I, I, dream for, I dream for a world where you have men like that too. I dream for this world for everybody. Can you imagine what the Jewish community would look like if everybody learned Torah? And everybody knew Torah? I mean, that's how it's supposed to be, obviously. But somehow we've created this model where you can be religious and never study Torah. There are people who keep kosher for 40 years. But they don't even own a Shulchan Aruch. So how do they really keep kosher? Where did they ever learn the laws of Kashrut? From what? From which? From some pamphlet that some guy wrote somewhere in Brooklyn because he makes money from Kashrut business or what? Where is it? One of my students says a Kashrut is really just cash root. It's all about cash at the root of the industry. That's what it is all about. Yes. But this is something that Shabbat, you keep Shabbat. How long in your life you keep Shabbat? You ever study the Chod Shabbat? You know where to find Yechot Shabbat? Fine. Any book you want. So how can you say, it's like, I'm a lawyer, but I never went to law school. I'm a doctor, but I never went to medical school. So what are you really? You're delusional, is what you are. A lot of people think they are all kinds of things that they're not. Just because I want to be an astronaut doesn't make me an astronaut. If I want to be an astronaut, there are steps I can take to become an astronaut. But one of them is not sitting in my chair wanting to be an astronaut. And so when I see all kinds of Jews, and it's not just Jews who became observant or Jews who converted, it's Jews who were born in the Jewish community, all, all across the spectrum. And their education is, is minimal, if anything. Or the last time they went to a class when they graduated high school, but they're 70. So then are they really halakhically observant Jewish people? Or are they just like the parrots in the cages or the monkeys in the zoo that can imitate what other people do? And you should know this has gone so far that there are rabbis in good standing that have written articles lamenting this new trend in Judaism that people study Judaism instead of doing what the people around them did. 
There's a famous article, I don't want to mention to you on the camera, off the camera I can tell you, but he, he praises this culture of, we did Judaism because that's how we saw the people around us doing it. And that these modern Jews that went off to yeshiva and came back with these books and they, they disrupted the organic Jewish life in the world. That's, I mean, it's already turned into a, a, like a, an ideal. It's an ideal to just be a bunch of people imitating each other. So what is Maran telling us? Nashim mevachot bichat Torah. Women recite the blessing over the Torah, telling you that women are obligated in the blessings of the Torah. Okay, I'm going to end this you now. B'zad uh, will come back on Thursday. Just it will be a, a much shorter class because we only have about uh, 10 pages left to do. Nah, a little more. But just about the all the things we say in the beginning of Tefillah, it's important that we do that class because uh, we are going to be going right into volume number 4, which arrived right here. Volume number four, and it starts right after these halachot end. So we're going to be smack in the middle of the laws of the Bidah Knesset. You want to get these last pages in. I know it's the last Thursday before Pesach and all that. We're not going to have classes next week. So use up this last opportunity Thursday night to come back. Let's learn. Let's finish it. And Bezat Hashem, Barach, we will begin a new book on uh, right after we come back from Pesach break. And so for those who have not yet ordered that book, please go online. There's a link in the Google Classroom to order the book. If you live here, don't pay shipping. You'll just pick it up when class starts. For those of you who live abroad, uh, there's a shipping fee, and we will get it out to you as soon as we possibly can. Tiskul Mizvot, and thank you so very much for learning with me tonight.